a king has the blind men of the capital brought to the palace where an elephant is brought in and they're asked to describe it. When the blind men had each felt a part of the elephant, the king went to each of them and said, Well, blind man, have you seen the elephant? The man whose hand landed on the trunk said, It's like a thick snake. And the man who had touched the ear said, It's like a big fan. An elephant is like a tree trunk, said the man touching the leg. It's like a wall, said the man touching its sides. While the man touching the tail said, No, it's like a rope. An elephant is hard and smooth like a spear, concluded the man touching the tusk. Keep that parable in mind as I tell you a little bit about the captivity stories of white people and the American frontier. In the centuries before European intervention, the native people seemed to live somewhat peacefully among themselves. On only rare occasions have they found mounds and burial places with people who had suffered trauma. That began to change in 1492 on the east coast of America and in the southern area the 1500s when DeSoto and Coronado made their way into New Mexico. Forced to build cathedrals in cities and to convert to Catholicism. They were now slaves of the white people. The American plan was to reduce them to farmers. And when that didn't work, the plan was just to reduce them. It's estimated that there were 900,000 Native Americans living in a, what we call America when Columbus landed. By the late 1800s, that number had been reduced to 300,000, and they were all corralled on reservations. They taught us how to grow corn and live in an environment we were unfamiliar with. From us, they learned how to lie. From the Spanish, they learned torture and burning at the stake. And from the French in the north, they learned to swap scalps for products. However, taking captives in a battle or raiding a village was a common ancient practice. Some captives became slaves. Some were tortured and killed. Thousands of white people were adopted into the Native American tribes with full privileges. Children were often taken to replace one that had died and to console a grieving mother. As the colonists pushed westward, the Indians pushed back. In the mid-1800s, as wagon trains flooded the west, that meant more and more women were also coming west. And although in reality it was disease that killed most frontiers people, it was the Indians that they feared. Without a sound of preparation or a word of warning, the bluffs before us were covered with a party of about 250 Indians, painted and equipped for war, who uttered their wild war hoop and fired a signal volley of guns and revolvers into the air. With all the power I could command, I begged my husband not to fight but to attempt to make peace with the Indians. The Lakota tribe went along with it for a little while. There was a spontaneous discharge of arms when the 
cloud of smoke cleared away, I could see the retreating form of Mr. Larimer and the slow motion of poor Mr. Wakefield, who was mortally wounded. Mr. Sharp was killed within a few feet of me. Mr. Taylor, I can never forget his face as I saw him shot through the forehead with a rifle ball. I could see not my husband anywhere, and I didn't know his fate. Actually, he and Andy made a miraculous escape, and I did not learn this until long afterward. Fanny Kelly lived among the Indians for eight years. She was sold to another chief two times. The Indians would attack the settlers. The soldiers would attack the Indians' villages. Kelly says, We were forced to flee to a place known among them as the Badlands, a wildly desolate and barren section of country. Everything has a ruined look, as if vegetation and life had formerly existed, but had been suddenly interrupted by some violent commotion of nature. A choking wind blows continually and fills the air with blinding dust. As soon as we were safe, the warriors returned home. A scene of terrible mourning over the killing took place among the women. Sometimes a practice of cutting the flesh is carried to a horrible extent. They inflict gashes an inch in length on their bodies and limbs. Some cut off their hair, blacken their faces, and march through the village in procession, wailing and torturing their bodies. Hunger followed in a track of grief. All our food was gone, and there was no game in that portion of the country. The Indians were terribly enraged. Fanny engineered her own rescue and went on to write a very popular book about her escapades. In fact, captivity narratives, both male and female, were extremely popular back on the East Coast. Sort of like uh, dime novels, I suppose. Only it was real-life stories. But they often left the juicier parts out and up to the reader's imagination. After Josephine Meeker was rescued, in order to determine which members of the Ute tribe to punish, Josephine's testimony was taken under oath. Josephine, of course we were insulted a good many times. We expected to be. What do you mean by insult, and what did it consist of? Josephine, of outrageous treatment at night. Am I to understand that they outraged you several times a night? Josephine. Yes, sir. Forced you against your will? Josephine. Yes, sir. Few female captives were as lucky as Josephine Meeker. Some survivors became, in their minds, so degraded by the time they were rescued that they had little desire to leave the Indians. After five years with the Apaches, Olivia Oatman appeared indifferent to being returned to civilization. And if they were adopted and married in the tribe, they often discovered they had more autonomy and freedom than they had in their white world. Some famous captives, like Mary Jensen, taken by Shawnee Indians, a century earlier and traded to the Seneca, about the same age as Olivia, uh, nine when she was captured, stayed with the Indians. Or Cynthia Ann Parker, who lived with the Comanche from the age of nine until she was forcibly and tragically, I suppose, returned at the age of 34 in 1860. She never really fully assimilated back into the white world. We pushed, and we pushed, and they resisted as best they could, and thousands died. It is estimated that a little less than 10,000 Native Americans were murdered by white settlers, white people. 
while almost 8,000 white people died in the hands of Indians in massacres. <laughs>